and uh, I'm very excited to see that there are so many people interested in this tutorial, uh, which is on comparative methods uh, for regulatory genomics. So we have a set of uh, lectures. There are five lectures in all, and uh, the first one is going to be on whole genome alignment, and that is going to be presented by Professor Colin Dewey, who is at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With that, uh, do you want this? Thanks. Um, yeah. All right, great. Well, thanks, Sushmita, for in involving me in this tutorial on uh, comparative regulatory genomics. So I'll be speaking on, on whole genome alignment. And you might be wondering, well, what does whole genome alignment have to do with comparative regulatory genomics? And I'll try to con convince you of that very early on, and then about the comparative part of this, this whole deal. So maybe to motivate, uh, we'll first think about a couple of questions that might be uh, of interest to you uh, if you're getting into uh, comparative regulatory genomics. The first might be, uh, say I've, I've characterized some regulatory element in the species X, and, I, and I'm interested in maybe the evolution of that regulatory element, and I want to know where is that element located in the genome of some other species Y. Uh, or maybe more, more broadly, perhaps I've located a, a potential regulatory region, some stretch of the genome uh, in the species X that I'm very interested in in terms of its regulatory potential, and I want to know where is that interval where is its corresponding interval in the species wise, should that, that interval also exist. And since we're all sort of computational biologists or genomicists, we want to do this at scale across the whole genome, and so I'd like to ask this question for every single regulatory element in every single uh, regulatory region. Okay, so that's where whole genome alignment comes in. It's going to get at those correspondences that you need to answer these questions. Okay, so just all outlines are the topics that I'll talk about today. So first of all, get at this question of what does it mean that uh, by corresponding. So what does that mean to find the corresponding element between genomes? And so perhaps some of this is old hat to, for some of you, but we'll review the concepts of homology, orthology, and a more specialized term that I've introduced recently in the literature, uh, top orthology, to get at sort of the, what we really mean by corresponding between genomes. And I'll describe how whole genome alignment is a, a correspondence of sorts between uh, the genomes of different species, and I'll talk about the representation and the meaning of those representations of whole genome alignments. And lastly, I'll, I'll review, uh, in general, the computational approaches that have been used to address the task of whole genome alignment, and I'll partition them into broad categories of local and hierarchical approaches, and then I'll talk briefly about the sort of the basic um, computational algorithm, algorithm techniques that are used in terms of local alignment and chaining for that problem. Okay, so first talk about the notion of genomic correspondence, and so there are two uh, general ways that one might define the correspondence between, uh, between genomes. The first would be a functional correspondence, whereby we're, we're trying to identify uh, the regions of, of genomes that correspond in terms of their having similar function to each other. So uh, if we're interested in, in regulatory genomics, we might be interested in, uh, if I think about one region that I want to find its corresponding region in the other. And if that region is bound by some transition factor, then maybe I want to find the, the sort of corresponding region in the other gene that's also bound by that factor. Or um, maybe that region uh, interacts in three dimensions, as we'll learn about a little bit later, uh, with some other region in the genome, and I want to find the sort of corresponding region in the other species genome that also has that same kind of 3D interaction. So those would be kind of functional correspondences in which the sort of the biochemistry is corresponding. The other notion of correspondence would be evolutionary correspondence, and where we're only, what we only care about is uh, common ancestry of those regions, so that the sequences are um, derived from some common ancestor. And this is where the concepts of homology and subrelations of orthology and prology come into play. Okay, so often these, these notions of correspondence are the same um, for many regions, so things that, are, that tend to be are evolution related well, often will have similar function. But that's not always the case, and sometimes those differences are, are very interesting. Um, but whole genome alignment in general is, is only going to focus on evolutionary relationships, uh, primarily because it's dealing uh, mainly with the raw primary sequence of genomes to, to uh, determine the correspondence. It's not looking at other 
uh, sort of functional data that might inform uh, functional correspondences, if that's what you're interested in. OK, so just a, a review of, of the notion of homology and the subrelations of homology. So in general, homology is a, it's a very um, old term. It just refers to the relationship of two biological characters having a common ancestor. And so a biological character is some kind of uh, feature of an organism. It could be a morphological feature, say the number of digits on your, uh, one's, um, one's foot, uh, and looking that, that across species. And homology just means that that, that sort of feature is, is, is uh, related via common ancestry across uh, for all those species. So for us, we're dealing with genomic sequences. So we're looking at homology at the nucleotide level. And for, in that case, a, a character is a, a genomic position in a genome. And ancestry of genomic positions is derived via a template-driven nucleotide synthesis. So that the way DNA copies itself gives rise to uh, ancestry at the individual uh, nucleotide level. OK. And there are two sort of really important subrelations of homology that will be important for us today. So the first, and probably the most important, is orthology. Uh, which is the, the relation of homology, but where the original divergence uh, from the common ancestor, most recent common ancestor of two homologous elements, uh, that divergence occurred due to a speciation event. So sort of separation via speciation and divergence uh, after that point. Uh, whereas uh, pyrology, um, the divergence from the most recent common ancestor is due to a duplication event within, the, uh, say, the same genome. Okay, so there's one other subrelation, which is xenology. That has, has to do with horizontal gene transfer. I won't focus too much on that um, today, um, but that might come back a bit li later today in other lectures. OK, uh, so just to give a, a figure to kind of <coughs> drive home um, orthology versus prology in terms of genomic sequences. Uh, here I have an example of an ancestral genome. Oops. Up here, let's say it, uh, a genome that has just three genomic segments, x, y, and z. You can think of them as genes. And then there's a speciation event giving rise to species A on the left, and um, another sort of ancestral genome here. Uh, there's maybe a duplication event of the, the second gene, gene Y, uh, here, and then followed by a speciation event giving rise to species C and D. Okay, so we might be interested in, in orthology and pyrology of, say, that, that red interval there, the gene Y. And maybe to simplify things, you could draw a phylogenetic tree or a gene tree for that region uh, with all the extant uh, copies here at the bottom. And I've drawn this tree such that whenever there is a divergence from a, in, at the internal node due to a speciation event, it has sort of an inverted V shape. And when there's a, a duplication event that gives rise to the divergence, there's a sort of a flat line. So this represents the duplication here. And the sort of upside down V here is due to the speciation event uh, here. So one trick to, sort of to determine um, orthology and pyrology is to sort of trace up the, the tree. Uh, so for any pair of, of genes, trace up the tree to their most com recent common ancestor and look at what uh, form of di divergence you find. So for YA, its most recent common ancestor with any of these elements is up here. And the divergence from that internal node was a speciation event. So YA is orthologous to all four of these segments. Uh, YC1, if I if it's in its relation to YD1, I see that that's related via speciation event. So that's orthologous. However, YC1, if I trace the most recent common ancestor with YC2 and YD2, there's a duplication event. So YC1 is paralogous to both YC2 and YD2. Okay. And note that something can be paralogous to both something within the same genome and also to genes in the other genome. So YC1 and YD2 are in different species and they are par paralogous sequences, uh, as are in YC1 and YC2 are in the same genome, also paralogous. Okay, and so here's the full matrix if you want to figure out all the pairwise relations there. Okay, all right, so why, why bother with this? So uh, orth orthology is most often used as the genomic notion of correspondence, or sort of the same, kind of the same region across different species. Um, however, it, one often wants relations between these, these sort of species to be to be one to one. That makes it, things a lot easier in terms of our downstream analyses. But orthology in general is not uh, a one to one relation. 
So we'll need to take that into account. And uh, the reason for that are, of course, duplications. And there are a variety of types of duplications that can give rise uh, to these relationships. So segmental duplications, which are large chunks uh, being copied in tandem or, or elsewhere in the genome. Retrotransposition, which involves um, sort of genes being moved around via their transcriptional products or, or copied into other places in the genome. And then whole genome duplications would simply just duplicate the, the quantity of the number of chromosomes you have. OK. So one thing that comes up is that so we often drive towards this one-to-one -one relation because that's most convenient to us. That's definitely not the case for orthology. But there are often some uh, cases where in a set of orthologs, there tend to be pairs of orthologs that seem to be sort of the most equivalent across those genomes. And it's, um, I'm not sure what I get as one notion of how some orthologs might be sort of more equivalent than others. Okay, and the idea here is that the position of orthologs within genomes it, it matters uh, in terms of, of function and evolutionary scenarios. Okay, and to get at uh, the notion of some more refined notion of orthology, you have to distinguish between different types of duplications that occur within genomes. So. And I'm going to talk about symmetric versus asymmetric duplications. Okay, so I'm going to say that a duplication is symmetric in a genome if at, immediately after the duplication event, if I can remove either copy of the duplicated material and return to this, the same uh, original genome, then that's a symmetric duplication event. So both sort of du copies of that duplication event are sort of equivalent in some sense. If it's the case that only one specific copy after the duplication event can be removed to return back to the original state of the genome, then that's an asymmetric duplication event. And the, the copy that you can remove to get back to that original genome, I'll refer to as the target. Okay, so here's a figure giving the two examples of these. So here on the, on the left, I have a symmetric duplication of that middle gene Y. Uh, in this case, it's sort of a, a tandem duplication of that gene. So here, both of those copies are essentially equivalent in terms of their position within that genome. And I can remove either one to return to this, this version of the genome. On the other hand, in the lineage leading to species B, I have an asymmetric duplication with the middle gene uh, having a copy made at near the end of the chromosome. And here, it's the case that I can only remove this last copy uh, to return to the, the original genomic state. If I remove this copy here, then I would have a different looking genome. Okay. So in, in the, again, in the symmetric duplication, genes sort of remain in their ancestral position, whereas in the asymmetric duplication, only one copy remains in that uh, ancestral position. Okay. So with that notion of duplications in mind, um, I can define what's, um, what I refer to as, as top orthology, where top is the Greek prefix for, for location. Um, or if you'd like, you said the sort of top is sort of like the best or ortholog in some sense. That's the only way to, to remember it. So I'm going to say that two genomic segments are top orthologous if they are orthologous, and neither of those segments are derived from the target of an asymmetric duplication since the time of the most recent common ancestor of those segments. Okay, so um, maybe it's best to illustrate with an example over here. So here I have a another similar evolutionary scenario. On the left, I have a symmetric duplication of that middle gene Y, followed by some inversion event that's not terribly relevant to us. On the right, I have some asymmetric duplication, followed by a symmetric duplication, a whole genome duplication. And here is the sort of gene tree of, for, for Y. Um, here it has the same sort of notion of uh, upside down Vs for speciation and then flat lines for duplications. But the addition of one other notation on this tree where I draw an arrow uh, downward towards the, the target of an asymmetric duplication. So this was a duplication event, and then everything that's derived from this on this branch, those are the from the target side of that duplication. So if I want to determine if something is, is top orthologous, what I can do is, again, trace to the most recent common ancestor of a pair of genes. If I end up at a speciation event, then I know that they're orthologous. And if I don't cross through one of these downward uh, facing arrows, then I know that I am top orthologous. So that means that YB11 and YA1 or YA2 are top orthologous, whereas YB21 or YB22, uh, those are going to be um, atop orthologous or, or not top orthologous to, uh, to YA1 or YA2. 
So hopefully you can get a sense that sort of the top orthologous genes are those or those orthologs that are that generally remain kind of in the same uh, ancestral position, uh, whereas the orthologs that are not top orthologous have different generally different uh, genomic positions. Okay, so top orthology is generally um, more likely to be a one-to-one -one relation between genomes, but it's not, again, not necessarily going to be uh, to have that. But it does remove a lot of these asymmetric duplications, which often uh, sort of litter the orthology uh, relations of, that we encounter. Okay, so why top orthology? Um, so it's been well known um, for many years that gene expression is significantly affected by genomic position. So if you move a gene around, you're going to affect its, its expression. Um, epigenetics are also found to be impacted by uh, the position of a genomic segment. And there are often very different evolutionary constraints on different on gene copies that are, are in different locations within the genome. Um, so it's been shown that orthologs uh, that also have a conserved genomic position are generally uh, more highly conserved, and that um, targets of asymmetric duplications often have higher levels of positive selection, and they're sort of, and sort of diverging from the ancestral form in some way. Okay. Um, so, it, so as a general rule, often the top orthologs are the ones that are sort of most corresponding between genomes. However, it should be noted that, you know, this, that's just a general rule. There are always exceptions, as one finds in biology. So top orth orthologs are not always the most similar orthologs between a pair of genomes. You could very well have the, the target of a duplication event become the the gene that goes on to retain the function of the ancestral copy, uh, but those are going to be more the exception rather than, than the rule. Okay. So I'm going to take a brief pause here for a, a top quiz. Um, so here's an evolutionary scenario, similar to what we've seen before, um, with a speciation event followed by uh, an inversion and duplication on this side, and then a, a duplication event. Uh, followed by speciation on this side here, giving right to three species, A, B, C. And focusing, so the blue and the red are the only genes with some action here. Um, so think about, maybe take one minute to think about what are the genomic segments that are top orthologous to segment Y, B, which is here. And number two, which genomic segments are top orthologous to segment X, B, 2, this blue guy here. Okay, so I'll give you maybe one minute to think about it, and then I'll reveal the answers. Right, so I won't keep you in suspense any, any longer. Um, so for number one, what is genomic segments are top orthologous to segment YB? So YB is here. And if we trace up to the most recent common ancestor for both YC and YA1 and YA2, you see that um, they're both YB is orthologous to both YC and YA1 and YA2. And there's been no asymmetric duplication in the history of, of that gene. So YB is top orthologous to both YC, well, YA2 and YA1. So all of those are all top orthologs. Um, XB2 is a different matter. So XB2, if you can kind of trace back here, is sort of derived by this, um, this guy here, which was the target of an asymmetric duplication. So XB2 is not top orthologous to um, XA over here. So it's, it's not top orthologous there. Um, and neither is it top orthologous to XC1. Um, but XB2 and XC2 are derived from the same, uh, this guy here. And so they are top orthologous. Um, and since this duplication here is a symmetric one, XB2 is also top orthologous to X3C3. So XB2 is top orthologous to XC2 and XC3 only. Okay. Right. okay. 
So a summary of us far. Uh, so if we're going to perform any sort of comparative genomic studies, we need to know what the corresponding regions are between two or more genomes. And so what I've tried to describe to you are oh, what, what sort of correspondence are we after. Uh, whole genome alignment is going to focus on evolutionary relationships. Uh, and usually corresponding is going to refer to orthologous. But if you want to be more precise in terms of sort of positional correspondence, uh, top, ortholo top orthology is what you're after. And so now I'll move on to uh, whole genome alignment, what that means, and how do we re represent whole genome alignments. Okay, so whole genome alignment is generally going to be the task of predicting homologous pairs of nucleoside positions between two or more genomic sequences. Uh, usually whole genome alignment is focused on only a subrelation of homology, so not all homology, but typically usually only orthology or some, something similar to top orthology. Um, when general homology is predicted by whole genome alignment, that means you can find alignments uh, both between species as well as within species. So you might find all the paralogs within the same genome. Okay, so what makes this task hard? Um, so of course, when looking at, at the whole genome level, we have to deal with evolutionary events such as rearrangements and duplications. Uh, here is uh, a figure from the Pevsner and Tesla paper in 2003 which showed how there's uh, a rearrangement scenario uh, for chromosome X in mouse and human. So the mouse chromosome on the top and human chromosome X on the bottom with a series of rearrangement uh, inversion events that get you from one that chromosome to the other. Uh, genomes are also very large, of course, so say the human's three billion characters long. And we often want to compare many genomes at once. So if the Genome 10K project uh, succeeds, we'll have something like 10,000 vertebrate genomes, all of you know, roughly three billion uh, letters in length to, to align to each other. Okay. So the general representation of a whole genome alignment usually relies on uh, a subunit generally known as a block. And a block is generally just a, a nucleotide level alignment matrix for some set of, of collinear and homologous sequences. So here's an example of, say, an alignment or a slice of an alignment block of a piece of the alignment of. Uh, the sonic hedgehog gene in, in humans. So this is the UC Santa Cruz genome browser focused in on one part of that gene. And here are a bunch of uh, vertebrate species that have been aligned to that same place within the human genome. And so this would be essentially a component of a block of that whole genome alignment of those species against the human. Okay. So a whole genome alignment will then be a sort of a collection of all uh, of a bunch of these blocks. And one nice notion here to think about is uh, what's called a threaded block set, introduced by Blanchett in 2004, um, which is a set of these, uh, of these blocks uh, such that every position in every genome is represented in, in uh, exactly one block, and that each genome can then be constructed as some kind of directed path through a set of blocks uh, within that alignment. So here's a figure to illustrate that. I have three species um, with genomic segments with color labeling uh, how they're homologous to the other segments. Here's the set of blocks that you would construct given those homologies. And then within each block, you can slice that out and you would sort of see the exact nucleotide correspondence between uh, the, segments, the segments in that block. Okay, and so to re reconstruct any particular species, I would sort of jump, uh, say for the species A, I would jump from say this block to X, uh, back to X again to this block and then finally to that block to reconstruct uh, that species. Um, another aspect of representing whole genome alignments it is in terms of representing adjacencies between uh, the different blocks or segments that are in the alignment. And uh, Kerr et al. in 2014 gave a nice review of the various uh, graph structures that are used for representing these adjacencies. Um, so the, the classical way of representing an alignment would be what's called the alignment graph, uh, in which each genome is represented by this sort of linear path of nodes, say this blue path here and uh, with directed edges indicating adjacent genomic segments, and then undirected edges representing uh, homologies between segments across genomes. Okay, so that's sort of maybe the sort of easiest graph to sort of think about. Um, we then had the, uh, a brown graph, which essentially collapses the homologous segments together into a single node, each node representing now essentially a block, and then directed edges representing adjacencies between blocks 
um, with edges coming from all different, um, all different species. Uh, the Enredo graph, which is part of the Enredo method for constructing whole uh, homology maps, which I'll discuss later, um, is a slight modification of the Brown graph in which each node now is represented by a pair of nodes representing the directionality of, uh, of the segments within each block. So this, the uh, Brown graph essentially removes uh, the information regarding the orientation of, of each of the segments uh, in the block, and the Enredo graph uh, preserves that. Okay. More recently, we've had a structure um, called a cactus graph um, and Patton and others uh, in, as part of the, the cactus method for whole genome alignment, um, which is quite a different beast, but it's essentially a, a dual graph to the Enredo graph in which the connected components of the directed edges in the Enredo graph form nodes in the cactus graph, and the undirected edges form uh, directed edges in the cactus graph. Okay, so, so nodes, which are these large, so this middle figure here is a cactus graph. The nodes here, these big circles, represent those connected components in the Enredo graph, and they represent uh, adjacencies uh, between genomic segments. And then the edges here represent uh, the blocks or the actual sequences. And uh, the argument that I won't be able, be able to get, get into here is that the cactus graph uh, gives you some kind of visual view of the overall structure of a whole genome alignment between two or more species. You can kind of see that there are sort of linear or collinear paths. Uh, each cycle represents some kind of collinear, collinearity between blocks uh, within these genomes, and there are sub substructures that can also be revealed at lower levels within the graph. Okay, so just to summarize in terms of the uh, whole genome alignment definition representation. So whole genome alignments predict homology relationships between single nucleotides, or between pairs of nucleotides. Usually the focus is on orthology or top orthology. Uh, the core component of whole genome alignment is, a, is one of these blocks. And then the representations vary in terms of how they represent adjacencies between blocks, and usually in the form of one of these graph type structures. Okay. So I'll get now to uh, some of the basic approaches for whole genome alignment, and it's useful to compare these approaches to uh, a general kind of baseline approach that you might uh, naively explore, uh, which would be simply an all versus all blast of all of your genomes against all the other genomes, okay? So why would, why would one, one want to do this? Well, it, this is super easy to implement. Um, you just give, give blast each, each genome as a query and each other against all the other genomes, including itself. And it also easily avoids issues of rearrangements and duplication. So you're doing a local alignment. You don't require that all the genomes are collinear with each other. Okay. However, there are a lot of drawbacks to doing this. So, so first, if you do this, you won't. Uh, Blast is only going to find things that are significantly um, similar and that give that give you evidence that they're actually homologous. But it doesn't give you any notion of whether which segments are or orthologous or parologous. Uh, to each other, so it doesn't get at the subrelations of homology. There's no guarantee that any of the pairwise alignments that you get back for BLAST are consistent with each other in terms of which pairs of nucleotides are aligned to each other. And it may miss homologous sequence that might be um, well supported by flanking homologous sequence uh, within the genome, but that has such low similarity that it's not picked up by a, a local alignment that's only looking at a very small region uh, of the genome. Um, and lastly, this is probably a very computationally expensive technique. Uh, it's not taking advantage of the transitivity of, of homology and other sort of tricks that one can use when comparing genomic sequences that are often highly similar in regions and highly dissimilar in others. Okay. Okay, so with that baseline approach in mind, there are sort of two general classes of whole genome alignment methodologies. And I describe them as local and hierarchical. So the local methods. Uh, are sort of a two-step process, first with a, a, a highly sensitive local uh, pairwise alignment between a set of input genomes, much like the all versus all blast, but, um, but specialized in a way to not be so expensive. And then a second step that kind of filters and merges these local pairwise alignments uh, to form a, a cohesive whole genome alignment that typically will focus on some subrelations, say, uh, orthology between genomes. On the other hand, the, the hierarchical approach uh, first starts out by identifying uh, sort of a large-scale mapping between the genomes, 
identify collinear and homologous segments, usually orthologous segments, between pairs of genomes. And then within those sets of uh, collinear and homologous segments, we'll perform a sort of a global alignment uh, of those segments to form an actual uh, nucleotide level alignment. So in comparing the two approaches, uh, the advantages of the local approach are generally that it's more sensitive to small rearranged or, or diverged segments that wouldn't be picked up um, by sort of a, a larger scale hierarchical method. And in regions of where there's lots of loss of collinearity, uh, often you can be a, a bit more precise uh, with local methods because they don't assume have such strong assumptions of collinearity. On the other hand, the hierarchical approach, when there are sort of regions of high collinearity, they'll tend to be more sensitive uh, in terms of finding uh, orthologous uh, pairs of sequences, and it's potentially faster, and that you're kind of breaking the problem into a bunch of sub-problems based on this initial homology map. Okay, so regardless of which approach you use, both, both approaches are going to use a, a local pairwise genomic alignment as their initial step. Okay, and Pretty much all of them use the same kind of general seed and extend type heuristic that BLAST uses for finding local alignments in which first a very short, often exact or slightly inexact um, match between the two large sequences is identified. And then that short match is then extended out uh, via variations of the Smith-Waterman algorithm to extend that into a, more, uh, a, a larger local alignment. Uh, the methods vary in terms of the, the types of seeds that are used. You can use exact seeds, seeds that, in which you only count matches at certain positions. Um, the seed length can vary. And then seeds can also be in terms of either nucleotide sequence or, say, translated amino acid sequence, uh, depending on how divergent your sequences are. Uh, and here's a list of, sort of example methods that are used. So you could use BLAST, but these methods here are all sort of uh, more specifically designed for comparing large genomic sequences to each other. Okay. Um, a second step that is sort of common to most of the methods is a chaining step in which after that initial local alignment, um, uh, a chain of, of collinear and sort of consistent pairwise alignment is, is found. Um, here. So here's a set of local alignments. Here's a, a nice uh, sort of optimal chain that's found. And then to fill in the alignment between those, often some variants of, of the Neilman Winch alignment in which uh, global alignment is performed between uh, adjacent local alignments. Okay, so that's local alignment and chaining, which is common to most all of the, the methods. I'll give you a flavor now of, of what hierarchical whole genome alignment entails. So in this figure here, uh, each genome is represented by one of these uh, sort of broad lines here, and the circles represent um, homologous uh, bits, say a, a gene in each genome with the undirected edges here representing a, a homology statement between, between nodes in these, these three genomes. So in hierarchical whole genome alignment, the first step is to find these collinear uh, regions and, and homologous regions between the genomes, so those, these colored segments that I'm showing here, and then removing all the sort of the fine detail of there. There might be some refinement of the edges of those collinear regions, and then those, those segments that are deemed to be collinear and homologous are kind of grouped together into preliminary blocks that are then aligned at the nucleotide level with uh, a more um, designated genomic global aligner. Okay. So the methods that, that do these, this sort of high-level homology mapping step um, can be grouped into two sort of forms. One are graph-based methods in which all genomes are sort of considered at the same time. And they use one of these graph structures that I showed you before, an alignment graph, a brown graph, or a cactus graph, um, to find this map, whereby they, an initial map is constructed using sort of all homology statements. And then the graph is pruned and refined. You have a variety of heuristic methods to arrive at a graph structure that represents that high level mapping between the genomes. Um, in contrast, there are progressive methods that essentially uh, construct uh, pairwise orthology or homology maps. Uh, between, between genomes or ancestral genomes uh, going up a phylogenetic tree or a guide tree to, uh, to help um, do this in a phylogenetically <laughs> aware method. Okay. Uh, so after a homology map is constructed, then we have 
have to actually construct the nucleotide level alignments. Again, there are a variety of, of global genomic aligners that can, can get at this. Um, they generally can be classified as progressive or non-progressive, one that uses the, a tree to guide the alignment, and the non-progressive types, which, are, which tend to be, uh, take the strategy of kind of merging uh, in a greedy manner consistent local pairwise alignments to form a multiple alignment of its, of its inputs. Okay. Uh, I'll just briefly talk about some of the local approaches. So again, a local, local whole genome alignment approach only starts with a very sensitive local pairwise alignment to begin and then has a series of chaining and filtering steps to get at the alignments that you really care about, say the orthologous segments. Uh, so one of the oldest and most widely used packages is Mummer, which is a pairwise whole genome alignment method, mostly designed for prokaryotic sized genomes, but can also be used for larger genomes as well. It identifies local exact matches via suffix uh, array or tree. Um, and then there's a chaining step of these local matches via a variant of the Smith-Waterman algorithm. And then the chains that are identified from that, that last step can be filtered. Uh, the most common fil filter step is to say, uh, take the best chain uh, for every position within your genome of interest, find the, the highest scoring chain that overlaps that position, and remove all other chains that overlap that same position or, or truncate them somehow. And that sort of filtering will get at uh, more or orthologous relationships and sometimes even top, top, orthology, top orthology. Um, uh, Multi-Z is another sort of well-known method that uses a local approach, and these are extensively used at UC Santa Cruz for their genomic alignments. Um, it starts out with using the last Z pairwise genomic aligner, which is similar to BLAST, but customized for genomic comparisons. Uh, it chains these alignments together with this AXE chain program, and then there's a filtering step with chain net, which, like the filtering up here in Mummer, you can take, say, the best um, f chain for any particular position in the genome, maybe fill in gaps in those chains to find um, smaller orthologous regions as well. And then multi-Z is the method that combines the pairwise alignments identified from last Z into uh, multiple alignment blocks. So for all these methods, it's a, it's a fairly computationally expensive um, thing to do, and so you could do it uh, by yourself if you wish, but um, often there are pre-computed alignments that might well suit, suit your needs if you're just into doing some of the comparative downstream analyses. Uh, so here are some of the most popular spots for grabbing uh, large-scale multiple genome alignments, um, often of vertebrate genomes. So the UC Santa Cruz hosts the multi-Z alignments. Ensemble has a combination of Pecan and Reed or Mercator, and Vista has a, this combination of the supermap and lag and in a hierarchical approach to whole genome alignment. Okay. I'm just going to briefly say a few notes about um, there are methods that, given one of these initial whole genome alignments that you could check from these methods, you might be interested in, in particular um, regions of that genome and want to refine um, the alignment to get a, uh, something that's more accurate. And there are many methods for, for doing this, some which improve specific objective functions, others which try to improve the alignment of specific genomic elements, say if you're interested in protein coding genes, you might want to use a method that's sort of more aware that there are these structures of protein coding genes in the genome. Uh, as we'll get, get to later today, you might be interested in, in non-coding regulatory regions and improving the alignments of those regions of the genomes, or even, say, non-coding RNAs. You might need to take into account the secondary structure of those genes. Okay. So lastly, you might be interested in, in so, okay, so I've talked about all these different methods. Which one's the best one? Which one do I use to do my whole genome alignment? Well, of course, it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, and so one needs a, a good way to evaluate these things. Uh, the most extensive comparison to date of, of whole genome alignments has been this Alignathon project, which made extensive use of simulations via the Evolver software. So I re recommend that you check that out if you're interested in, in sort of simulation-based evaluations. Uh, but there are other sort of uh, simpler techniques for evaluating alignments uh, in terms of using uh, annotations of protein coding genes, making sure that they aligned sort of together and are not broken up too much. Uh, you can compare it to our orthology prediction programs, and you can also compute sort of simple statistics of coverage and um, sort of proxies for sensitivity and, and precision. Okay. So with that, I just want to summarize what I've talked about today. So a whole genome alignment is going to be one form of correspondence between a set of genomes that you might want to use for uh, comparative analysis. In general, whole genome alignments will predict homology, but 
they'll often focus on a subrelation, say orthology or, or top orthology. And I'd say if you take away anything from this lecture today, it's that whatever method you use, you need to be very conscious of what exact what subrelation your alignment method is getting you. So is it getting you all of homology? Is it getting you top orthology, orthology? If you can identify that, that's the most important thing for doing your downstream analyses. Sort of accuracy is almost secondary to some of that. Okay, and again, whole genome alignments can generally be partitioned into either hierarchical or local methods, with the hierarchical method starting out with a, a large scale mapping between the genomes, and the local method starting out with a very sensitive local alignment that gets filtered and merged. Okay, and then I didn't get a whole lot of time to talk about this, but uh, there's a growing literature on methods for both refining, sort of fine tuning whole genome alignments, and also evaluating them uh, in terms of their accuracy. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll leave you with this slide on further reading that I recommend. Um, you can look at many of these are just sort of reviews of the literature that will have links to some of the more um, specific methods that I described today. And this will be available online, so you can uh, check out these out later. Okay, with that, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take a few questions. Yeah, so top orthology um, doesn't care about rearrangement events. Um, so it's only about what happened when that, when those segments originally.